My name is John O'Shea. I'm the Senior Exhibitions Manager here at the museum. Um, and uh, in terms of this evening's event, Fake News on Trial, a um, couple of things we need to just mention at the very start. Um, we'd, like to support, uh, sorry, we'd like to acknowledge uh, Arts Council England's support uh, for these discussions that we've been hosting actually uh, for about a year now um, around a theme of digital cultures. Um, last year we began by bringing together some internal discussions with um, researchers and designers and artists and, and people who are working with technology. Um, but for this evening's event, uh, the topic of fake news, we felt it wouldn't be very good if we did something around fake news and we were just talking to ourselves. We were sort of inside the, the echo chamber. So, so we felt this should be a, a public event. Um, and um, so, yeah, um, now I had some information before. Uh, you'll notice that we're totally, totally full. Um, and I've had it on good authority that this is actually... Um, the largest crowd at a panel event at this museum, period. Um, so don't believe anything anyone says about any seats being empty or anything like that. Um, and um, the reason we're so busy this evening, I think, is um, it's the calibre of our guests who we're going to uh, introduce you to. Um, the way that the format of these things works is... Um, We'll have three short, quick-fire presentations um, from different perspectives. And then um, what we'll do is we're trying to sort of break things down quite quickly into a, initially a panel discussion and then uh, a Q&A where we're all uh, engaged in a discussion and hopefully a debate um, about this topic. Um, so the three uh, presentations, I'll, I'll do a more formal introduction when people uh, come up, but. On uh, stage left, we have uh, Natalie Kane. Uh, Natalie uh, is here from the um, v &A Museum uh, in London. Uh, we also have um, Samira Ahmed, who is a broadcaster, freelance broadcaster, but, and, um, but does a lot of work with... She's going to tell us some... If you've not come across Samira before, she'll, she'll tell you a little bit what she does. Um, and then we've got John Lubbock, who is here from uh, Wikimedia. So the foundation which is behind uh, Wikipedia, which, which some of you will have come across. Um, and uh, lastly, so we've got three presenters, but uh, the project, this fake news project here at the National Science and Media Museum, we've developed in uh, partnership with um, the uh, Department of Peace Studies at um, Peace Studies and International Development at the University of Bradford. So we're really uh, lucky also to have Dr. Gabor Batonyi, who uh, is uh, a historian and former journalist. We'll, we'll give a bit more info as we go. But, but from the perspective of the Peace Studies Department. So the way this will work, let's try and, try and explain this as simply as we can. For anyone who thought they were coming to an actual trial, um, really sorry about that. Um, you know, our marketing team had to sort of spin it to make it, uh, to make it attractive to people. We don't have any authority to lock anyone up after this event, um, but we are intending to interrogate our topic from multiple perspectives. So we have the perspective, uh, which Samira to an extent will be representing, of conventional news media. Um, we have the cultural institution, so Natalie, obviously I, I'm also a little bit coming from that perspective, working for the museum. Uh, we have John, who will be talking about the culture of online media and how um, Essentially, over the last decade or a little bit more, all of us can uh, edit and publish very, very easily and change things online. And a little bit how Wikimedia has sort of navigated that, that challenge uh, in relation to information. And, uh, and then Gabor has very, very kindly um, elected to join us as well. Um, the narrative of this uh, fake news project has sort of evolved while we've been working on it. And in the last couple of months, people will have heard things related to uh, potential uh, state intervention in the news media and in uh, online platforms um, throughout the world for, for different kinds of purposes. So Gabor will be able to give us a little bit of context for that, uh, if we, particularly if we get a little bit stuck. Um, so just so that people have a sense, if you haven't had a chance to visit our fake news exhibition on the gallery. Can anyone who's not attended the exhibition just pop up your hand, just so I have a sense? So, yeah, about half of the people. So we're going to open the gallery uh, after this, so you will get a chance if you've got time 
uh, to pop along and, and have a little look. Um, but I'm just going to give you a whistle-stop tour of what, what we did. Uh, and I'm just thinking this other microphone might be on, so I'll just lose this one. Um, so with our um, exhibition on the gallery, which is called Fake News, um, it's very, very unusual for museums to work in relation to highly contemporary subject matter. Um, we're, we're typically concerned with old stuff and history and things that are, that are fixed that we can sort of we can pin down the story quite well. But I suppose in the last year and a half, as this it feels like about a year and a half, this this fake news, um, which has been the the big story in the news itself, has sort of um, moved along. We felt as a museum we wanted to do something, and one of our one of the things we can do is temporary exhibitions. So what we did was we worked with some of our curators and researchers to draw some material together. So um, some of you may have seen, oh, we're actually at the end there. This is going to, um, so you've all now understood our exhibition fully. Um, and I'm going to, this is a bit unorthodox, but could everybody close their eyes for, uh, for, for, for five seconds, starting from now? So five, four, three, two, uh, you might need to keep them closed a bit longer. Uh, one. Okay, and open them again. Um, so... Um, what we've done in the exhibition, we've drawn on our collection because that's where we do have some expertise. This topic of fake news is moving very fast and it's very difficult to pin down. So as many of you will be aware, one of the gems of our collection is this material made by two uh, young girls uh, about 100 years ago, uh, the Cottingley Fairies. Uh, two cousins, Elsie Wright and Francis Griffiths, basically faked uh, photographs of fairies in their garden. And these photographs sort of developed a life of their own, not as actual living fairies, but as a story that, that carried quite slowly to begin with, but through the media to become an international news phenomenon. Influential people, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, writer of Sherlock Holmes, totally was believed that this w was imagery of uh, supernatural beings and, and, and um, you know, and, uh, shared this story very widely, uh, particularly in, in a book that he authored. Um, now, if we think about why this story carried in its day, you could say, well, who doesn't want to believe in fairies? You know, if you see something that you like and you think, yeah, that's that's something I, I'm um, drawn to, then you're more likely to perhaps share it. That's what we were thinking. Um, some of you may have seen, there was an image that did the rounds quite a bit last year during 2017, and this was one of the real um, reasons we wanted to do the exhibition. We're a museum concerned with uh, technologies of sound and of image. Um, there was a big story during 2017, uh, during the inauguration of the United States President uh, Donald Trump, um, where um, it was suggested that, that the crowds at the inauguration were less than there had been at the inauguration of the President Barack Obama uh, several years previous. Um, and for us, as, as an institution concerned with objects, real objects, and um, and what what it means to say if a photograph is true or false, uh, and and how we understand media, this um, kind of scepticism around something we can see is something we encourage. Actually, we want people to be skeptical of media. But uh, this this story, well, we we'll, we'll be talking about it more in more detail, I'm sure. Um, so we'll we'll go on to a couple of other things. Uh, it's widely argued and discussed that some of the online material relating to the 2016 and 2017 um, electoral campaign in the US, um, that stories were created um, essentially to, to generate advertising revenue. Our media platforms like Facebook um, rely on advertising revenue, um, uh, as do many, many news platforms uh, that that produce what they call news. And these platforms don't necessarily have any editorial oversight. So, so we looked into this a little bit. We also looked into our own archives, uh, the Daily Herald archive, uh, a researcher who is based here, Rebecca Smith, uh, is doing uh, some research for her PhD into a collection we have here. We have three million uh, photographs which form the Daily Herald picture library. Uh, and so what we drew out were examples where the story hadn't quite been um, corrupted, let's say, but um, aspects of the photographs had been changed to enhance the story. Um, so these are 
uh, traditional photo desks using cut and paste and using penciling things in. Uh, and on the right, you'll see on the top left, there are some bus conductors who are on strike. Uh, the photo desk essentially was requested to add in more hats um, to give the appearance of more bus conductors. Um, to the right of that, in the lead up to the Second World War, Jewish shopkeepers um, in, in Britain uh, decided they didn't want uh, German nationals to, to work within their shops. Um, uh, and this photograph, the police officer shown in the photograph was in the photograph, but was a little bit further to the left. So the photograph has been edited to bring in a level of drama. And at the bottom, uh, these two young children actually went missing. So it was a story that we can relate to today, you know, in the press. Um, and on the right, uh, someone from the photo desk actually painted in uh, a seaside background onto this photograph so that it could be presented as an exclusive photograph um, of the children. Um, we can all think about what the motives for these things may be. Um, one other thing we included in the exhibition, we, we, we looked at a lot this from a lot of angles. Um, this notion of, um, we have breaking news stories, it feels like all the time now, online, on the television, stories emerge, sometimes the facts aren't quite right, sometimes they change, and sometimes people can feel a bit cheated if they get one story one day and then a different story a few hours later. Um, this example, um, the Titanic, which most of us will be familiar with, um, when the Titanic sank, it was relatively early in the development of radio, and they had a radio on board, what, which was called a wireless, um, and the ocean liner company, um, White Star, broadcast that the Titanic was under tow, that it was being rescued, and that everybody would be saved. Um, and so several newspapers carried the story that everybody had been saved and uh, it was all fine, whereas uh, around 2,000 people did die in this tragedy. So if you think about this, this was in 1912. A um, hundred years and more have passed. The speed at which, at which news is produced and consumed and um, mashed up is uh, is very very uh, accelerated now. So so that's what we wanted to try and flag up. So that's a little bit what we've been doing as a museum. I've got some more points here, but I don't want to go on too long. Um, but I, I will, um, I suppose, declare a little bit of a, a stake just to um, you know, uh, I suppose, emphasise why we want to do this um, from a couple of angles. So the director of the Science Museum Group, Ian Blatchford, we're part of a, of a larger group of museums, the Science Museum Group, uh, gave a paper at the Museums Associ Association Conference um, quite recently. Um, and uh, regards, um, in this instance, he was talking about climate change. And he raised the point, well, you know, it's a question, should we tell both sides of the argument as, as a science museum, or should we stress where the body of expert opinion lies or should we adopt a more activist stance? And I'm keen for each of the panelists to think about what might be meant by this term activist in, in this uh, forum. And then also uh, another question he raised. Um, so in this kind of moment, um, should we uh, as institutions therefore do more, both in our museums and particularly in online forums, uh, to become places and moderators of debate and discussion. And that's the purpose of this this evening. We, we think, yes, we should, and we will, and we're going to try that. This is a new format, relatively new, uh, bringing the public into this, but that's what we want to do.